Do you think you could win a race against a group of birds? Would you be brave enough to even try? <laughs> well, hi there, Reader Adventure, and welcome to Storytime for Kids. <laughs> I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today we are continuing with Chapter 3 of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, where we'll meet a very unusual group of birds and see who's faster, Ben or Alice. Let's get started. Chapter 3 of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. A caucus race and a long tale. They were indeed a queer looking party that assembled on the bank. The birds with bedraggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, and all dripping wet, cross, and uncomfortable. The first question, of course, was how to get dry again. They had a consultation about this, and after a few minutes, it seemed quite natural to Alice to find herself talking familiarly with all of them, as if she had known them all of her life. <laughs> Indeed, she had quite a long argument with the lorry, who had at last turned sulkily and would only say, I am older than you and must know better. And this Alice would not allow without knowing how old it was. And as the lorry positively refused to tell its age, well, there was no more to be said. At last, the mouse, who seemed to be a person of authority among them, called out, <clears throat> sit down, all of you, and listen to me. I'll soon make you dry enough. They all sat down at once, and in a large ring with the mouse in the middle. Alice kept her eyes anxiously fixed on it, for she felt sure that she would catch a bad cold if she didn't get dry very soon. Ahem, said the mouse with an important air. Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. Silence all around, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favored by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English, who wanted leaders, and had been of late much accustomed to usurpation and conquest. Edward and Morcar, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria, ah, said the lorry with a shiver. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, said the mouse, frowning ever so slightly, but he said politely, Did you speak? Not I, said the lorry hastily. I thought you did, said the mouse. <clears throat> I proceed. Edwin and Morcar, the earls of Mercia and Northumbria, declared for him, and even Steigen, the patriotic archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable. Found what? said the duck. Found it, the mouse replied rather crossly. Of course you know what it means. I know what it means well enough. When I find a thing, said the duck, it's generally a frog or a worm. The question is, what did the archbishop find? The mouse did not notice this question, but hurriedly went on. Found it advisable to go with Edgar Atheling to meet William and offer him the crown. William's conduct at first was moderate. But the insolence of the Normans, how are you getting on, my dear? It continued, turning to Alice as it spoke. <clears throat> um, as wet as ever, said Alice in a melancholy tone. It doesn't seem to be drying me at all. In that case, said the dodo solemnly, rising to its feet, I move that the meeting adjourn for the immediate adoption of more energetic methods. Speak English, said the eaglet. I don't know the meaning of half these long words, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. And the eaglet bent down its head to hide a smile. Some of the other birds tittered audibly. <clears throat> what I was going to say, said the dodo in an offended tone, was that the best thing to get us dry would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race? asked Alice. 
Not that she wanted much to know, but the dodo had paused as if it thought that somebody ought to speak. And no one else seemed inclined to say anything. <clears throat> Why, said the dodo, the best way to explain it is to do it. And as you might like to try the thing yourself, some winter day, I will tell you how the dodo managed it. First, it marked out a race course in a sort of circle. Now the exact shape doesn't matter. And then all the party were placed along the course, here and there. There was no one, two, three, and away. But they began running when they liked and left off when they liked. So it was not easy to know well, when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so and were quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, the race is over. And they all crowded round it, panting and asking, but who's won? Who's won? Who's won? This question, the dodo could not answer without a great deal of thought. And it sat for a long time with one finger pressed against its face while the rest waited in silence. At last, the dodo said, everybody's won and all must have prizes. But who is giving the prizes? Quite a chorus of voices asked. Why, she of course, said the dodo, pointing to Alice. With one finger and the whole party at once crowded round her in a very confused way. Prizes, prizes, prizes. Alice had no idea what to do. And in despair, she put her hand in her pocket and pulled out a box of comfits. Luckily, the salt water had not got to it. And she handed them around as prizes, and there was exactly one piece all around. But she must have a prize herself, you know, said the mouse. Of course, the dodo replied very gravely. What else have you got in your pocket? It went on, turning to Alice. Only a thimble, said Alice sadly. Hand it over here, said the dodo. Then they all crowded round her once more while the dodo solemnly presented the thimble saying, we beg of your acceptance of this elegant thimble. And when it had finished the short speech, they all cheered. <laughs> Alice thought the whole thing very absurd, but they all looked so grave that she did not dare to laugh. And as she could not think of anything to say, she simply bowed and took the thimble looking as solemn as she could. The next thing was to eat the comfits. This caused some noise and confusion as the large birds complained that they could not taste theirs and the small ones <coughs> choked and had to be patted on the back. However, it was over at last and they all sat down together in a ring and begged the mouse to tell them something more. You promised to tell me your history, you know, said Alice and why it is you hate C and D, she added in a whisper, half afraid that it would be offended again. Mine is a long and sad tale, said the mouse, turning to Alice and sighing. It is a long tale, <laughs> certainly, said Alice, looking down with wonder at the mouse's tail. But why do you call it sad? And she kept on puzzling about this while the mouse was speaking. So that her idea of the tale was something like this. Fury said to a mouse that he met in the house, let us both go to the law, I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take no denial, we must have a trial, for really this morning I have nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur, such a trial, dear sir, with no jury or no judge would be wasting our breath. I'll be the judge, I'll be the jury, said cunning old fury. I'll try the whole caucus race and a long tail cause and condemn you to death. You are not attending, said the mouse to Alice severely. What are you thinking of? I beg your pardon, said Alice very humbly. You had got to the fifth bend, I think? I had not, cried the mouse sharply and very angrily. A knot, 
said Alice, always ready to be make herself useful, and looking anxiously about her, oh, do let me help and do it. I shall do nothing of the sort, said the mouse, getting up and walking away. You insult me by talking such nonsense. I didn't mean it, pleaded poor Alice, but you're so easily offended, you know. The mouse only growled in reply. Please come back and finish your story, Alice called after it, and all the other joined in in cheers. Yes, yes, please do, please do, please do. But the mouse only shook its head impatiently and walked a little quicker. What a pity it wouldn't stay, sighed the lorry as soon as it was quite out of sight. And an old crab took this opportunity, saying to her daughter, Aye, my dear, let this be a lesson to you to never lose your temper. Hold your tongue, ma, said the young crab, a little snappishly. You're enough to try the patience of an oyster. Oh, I wish I had our Dinah here. I know I do, said Alice aloud, addressing nobody in particular. She'd soon fetch it back. And who is Dinah, if I might venture to ask the question, said the lorry. Alice replied eagerly, <laughs> for she was always ready to talk about her pet. Dinah's our cat, and she's such a capital one for catching mice, you can't think. And oh, I wish you could see her after the birds. Why, she'll eat a little bird as soon as even look at it. The speech caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once, and old magpie began wrapping itself up very carefully, remarking, I really must be getting home. The night air doesn't suit my throat. And a canary called out in a trembling voice to its children, Come away, my dears. It's high time you were all in bed. On various pretexts, they all moved off. And Alice was soon left alone again. I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah. Alice said to herself in a melancholy tone, nobody seems to like her down here, and I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. <laughs> oh, my dear Dinah, I wonder if I shall ever see you any more. And here poor Alice began to cry again, and she felt very lonely and low-spirited. In a little while, however, she heard again the little pattering of footsteps in the distance. And she looked up eagerly, half hoping that the mouse had changed his mind and was coming back to finish his story. <laughs> wow, what did you think of chapter three? That was a most unusual race, huh? <laughs> Be sure to join us next week when we continue with chapter four of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Thanks so much for being a reader adventure. And until next time, happy story time. Bye. <laughs>